Well, I'll say good morning to everyone. It is good to see everybody here this morning, especially if you're visiting with us. And as Leland said, we do have those from Oklahoma, but that's all right. We, we allow them to come up. Well, it's good to see Harold and Cynthia and all of our other visitors as well. We appreciate you coming to be with us today. You recall that a couple of weeks ago we began a lesson on how to study the Bible. And we want to make Bible study an adventure. And in order to make Bible study an adventure, what we want to do is go in and, and do a brief summary of all the books so that we'll have an idea of what all the books are about. Last Sunday morning we got all the way through Song of Solomon on that, so we're going to start today with the book of Isaiah. Again, these are just brief summaries of the books, but there are things that are found in the books that should be very interesting to us because they are God's Word, and God's Word is what's going to lead us to heaven. First of all, Isaiah, his name means Jehovah is Salvation. And if you have one of the handout sheets there, you'll notice I only left you maybe one or two blanks to fill in, but you got to write notes in the rest of it. So that's all up to you what you want to write down. Of course, the writer of the book is Isaiah. Go back to the author of the book is the Holy Spirit. But the writer, the human writer, is Isaiah. Isaiah was contemporary with Amos, Hosea, Micah, and the kings that are mentioned in Isaiah 1.1. And I didn't give those to you. See, that's part of your Bible study adventure is to see who those kings are. Key features of this book, there's a treasure trove of prophecies about Jesus the Messiah. We see in there His virgin birth, His kingly reign, His kingly ministry, His death, His resurrection, His rejection, the spiritual kingdom, the church. And also, John the baptizer is prophesied. You might recall there in Acts chapter 8 that Philip began at the same Scripture that the eunuch was reading and preached unto him Jesus. The eunuch there was reading Isaiah 53. It is no wonder that Philip could start at Isaiah 53 and preach Jesus to the eunuch because of at least all the prophecies that are found in Isaiah. Isaiah was actually written to call Judah, the southern kingdom, back to God. Judah had fallen into apostasy. They were worshiping false gods. They had decayed morally. And there is a lot of history that is not given in the books of First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles that you can find here in the book of Isaiah. So these books can all be studied together and see the things that took place. When we look at the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah's name means exaltation of the Lord. Of course, the writer of the book there is Jeremiah. The key features of the book of Jeremiah is a personal look at the feelings of one of God's spokesmen. His courage, his conviction, his being disheartened by the people there in the city of Jerusalem. He was made a laughing stock. His messages were mocked. One of the kings actually cut up his message and burned it. And yet, he had a benevolent attitude toward those who were persecuting him. Jeremiah takes us from the rule of good King Josiah all the way through Babylonian cap or to Babylonian captivity, and then he was forced to go down into Egypt, where those Jews that had taken him would be destroyed by the Babylonians. When we come to the book of Lamentations, the book expresses sorrow and sympathy. The writer there is Jeremiah too. It is believed to have been written during the, the siege, the destruction, and the fall there of the city of Jerusalem. The key features in this book, there's something you're not going to get by just looking at the book. It's hidden in, or written in Hebrew parallelism or Hebrew poetry. Hebrew poetry does not have word rhyming. It has thought rhyming. It is written in the form of an acrostic. Chapters 1, 2, 4, and 5 are written in 22 verses. Each verse beginning with a different letter in consection, or consecutive letter there of the Hebrew language. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew language. Chapter 3 contains 66 verses, which contains three letters of the Hebrew language in the way that he wrote it. It also contains four funeral hymns for the city of Jerusalem. That's chapters 1 through 4. And it contains one prayer 
chapter 5 there of Lamentations. Lamentations is basically an agony over a war-torn scene. Jeremiah is looking and he sees everyone from kings and princes to starving mothers who ate their children suffering. Their enemies laugh at their demise and a penitent return is required and it is begun. When we come to the book of Ezekiel, his name means the strength of God. Ezekiel is the writer and he wrote in the land of captivity in Babylon. Ezekiel was taken captive in 597 B.C., the second time the Babylonians came into Judea. The key features of the book, we see God portrayed in His majesty and glory. We see a graphical portrayal of the apostasy of the people there. We see prophecies of judgment against heathen nations. We see the promise of a restoration and a glorious future. Ezekiel wrote to the captives in Babylon to help them understand why they were in captivity. And then there were prophecies of the destruction of Jerusalem which took place while Ezekiel was in captivity. And then he gives them the hope in God that only God can give. Then Daniel, the book of Daniel, his name means judgment of God or God my judge. The writer is probably Daniel. Daniel was taken captive to Babylon while he was a young man in his teens. That would have been in 606 B.C. whenever the Babylonians first came there into Judea. So he was taken captive before Ezekiel was. But Ezekiel and Daniel, therefore, would have been alive at the same time. One captive, or excuse me, both of them being captive there in the city of Babylon. Key features of the book shows God's control over all things. We see courage in the face of certain death. We see the result of foolish human pride. We see the fascinating prophecies for the time between the Testaments, from the time that Malachi was written to the time that Jesus, Jesus Christ was born. Daniel, it shows what happens to those who refuse to disobey God even in times of great trial and persecution. It shows captivity and that God's people can be faithful in captivity. It shows the refusal to worship the false gods of those who have captured them and once even the king demanded to be worshipped. We see bravery. We see some things that are hard to understand because God has opened up the scenes behind the curtain and we see things that are taking place. It's a very exciting book, the book of Daniel. Hosea, his name means Savior or Safety. The writer is Hosea, and he is contemporary with Amos, Isaiah, and Michael. Or Micah, I get that right, not Michael, but Micah. Key features of the book, God uses Hosea's unfaithful wife, her name is Gomer, as an illustration of Israel's unfaithfulness to God by worshiping the false gods that they were doing. The lack of knowledge we see destroys God's people. Hosea 4 6, and we'll read that in momentarily. Hosea shows the helplessness of those that turn their backs on God to avoid the destruction that is headed their way. You know, a lot of times in Hosea 4 6, we focus on the first part of that verse where it says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. But there are some very more important statements made in that verse. He says, Because thou hast rejected knowledge. They rejected knowledge of God. He said, I will reject thee. When we reject the knowledge of God, God rejects us. But then he also says, That thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. When we turn our back on God, God's going to forget our children. Why? Because we're not teaching them. That's pretty serious, isn't it? Joel. Joel's name means he that wills or commands. Joel is the writer. He is a prophet to the southern kingdom of Judah. He's contemporary with Hosea and Amos. The key features of that book 
the prophecy of the day of Pentecost whenever the church began. We'll look at Acts 2, 28-31 in a moment. He mentions several calamities that fell on Western Asia during that time as well. Joel 2, 28-31 says, It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out My Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and the handmaids of those days will I pour out My Spirit. And I will show wonders in heaven and in earth, blood and fire, pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned in the darkness and the moon in the blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord, that of the Lord come. You know, we go over to the book of Acts chapter 2, and I didn't put this in there, so we're going to look at it. Turn over to Acts chapter 2. Peter says that the very thing that happened that day is exactly what Joel was talking about. Verse 16 of Acts 2. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out My Spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And all My servants and all My handmaidens will I pour out in those days of My Spirit, and they shall prophesy. And continuing on there, but the church was established that day. That is a prophecy that Joel gave. All the way back at that time. And then Joel gives them instructions. They say to turn, he says to turn back to God by rending their heart, not their garments. You know, the rending of the garment is a show of, you know, whether of sadness or, you know, distress or whatever. He said, you need to be distressed, but you need to rend your heart, not your garments. Joel 2, 12 and 13. Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn ye even unto me with all your heart, and with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. And rend your heart and not your garments. And turn unto the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth Him of the evil. So again, all of these books, they're, they're all fascinating books. But they're all written by inspiration, of course. We come to the book of Amos. His name means loading or waiting. Waiting. Amos is the writer. The book was written during the time of Jeroboam II. There were two Jeroboams who were king over the ten tribes of Israel. The first one and then this one. This is the second Jeroboam. And he reigned during a very prosperous time in that ten northern tribes of Israel. Key features of the book, there's a message of doom to eight nations given there. The great wickedness of Israel is proclaimed and the fact that the end of the nation of Israel was near was also proclaimed. Amos prophesied against the decaying nation to try to get them to come back to God. When we receive, excuse me, Obadiah. Obadiah's name means a servant of the Lord. Obadiah is the writer. Obadiah is the shortest book of the Old Testament. Key features of the book, basically one. The destruction of the Edomites. Who are the Edomites? That's part of your Bible study adventure. To learn who the Edomites are. You know good and well who they are. Someone who is very prominent in the Old Testament is their ancestor. Obadiah prophesied the destruction of the nation of Edom of the Babylonians. During the time that Jerusalem was destroyed, Edom was destroyed also. Jonah. I found it interesting. His name means a dove, he that oppresses, or destroyer. All of those three would fit, wouldn't they? Jonah is the writer. Key features of that book. Number one, it is historical. Jesus referred to it in Matthew 12, 39-41. You know, people say, oh man, swallowed by fish and spit out. Oh, that's just, that's a... Fictitious. No, Jesus said it was true. Jesus said it was true. And we're going to read those verses momentarily. We also see from the book of Jonah that God holds heathen nations responsible to His law. We see you cannot run from God. doesn't matter where you try. And we see that God sometimes sends consequences our way to get us to obey. And then a very important point of the book of Jonah is racism is destructive. Jonah was very racist against those people of Nineveh. But we go back to the historical point of the book. Matthew 12, 39-41. to 
But he answered and said unto them, this is Jesus speaking to the people, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. Jesus said that is real. Do we believe Christ? Jonah proves that God cares for all of mankind and that God means what He says. Micah, his name means poor or humble. Again, Micah is the writer. He's contemporary with Isaiah. Key features of that book. Sometimes it's too late to avoid the consequences of sin. Also, Bethlehem was prophesied as being the birthplace of Jesus. And we see something that God requires of us in Micah 6.8. That verse reads, He has showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God? Requirements of us. Micah prophesied in the time of wicked King Ahaz of Judah. He spoke of matters that needed to be dealt with. And these are some of the matters that you will see there. Apostasy, idolatry, evil plans, covetousness, greediness, witchcraft, dishonesty, corruption, and treachery. All of those things are addressed by Micah. Nahum. His name means comforter or penitent. Nahum is the writer. It was written somewhere between the times of 630 and 612 B.C. This is after the captivity of the northern ten tribes in 721 and just prior to Babylonian captivity beginning in 606 B.C. Key feature to this book, the doom of Nineveh. You remember the Ninevites during Noah's day repented, but this is about 150 years after Jonah. And now they're going to be destroyed. Nahum shows us that God is good. That God is a stronghold for the faithful. That God is slow to anger, but God will punish those who are guilty. In Nahum chapter 1 and verse 3 it says, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, but notice He says, And will not at all acquit the wicked. He may be slow to anger, He may be great in power, but someday the wicked are going to pay. And it continues to say, The Lord hath His way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of His feet. Verse 7 says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and He knoweth them that trust Him. That's a very comforting verse, is it not? A verse that tells us that whenever these calamities come into our lives, we can go to God. We can go to God. And God knows who trusts Him. He knows When we come to Habakkuk, his name means he that embraces or a wrestler. That name wrestler really fits Habakkuk here as we look at it. The writer is Habakkuk. He is temporary with Zephaniah and Jeremiah. And the key feature really in this book is that he is speaking to God about a problem that he's wrestling with. And that is relating to God's rule over nations. He's wrestling with the idea. And this is what it is. He couldn't understand why sin was being tolerated in Judah. And then when God told him sin would not be tolerated, he would raise up Babylon to take care of that problem. Habakkuk wrestled with that as well, saying, well, why will you take a nation that is more wicked to punish a a nation that is less wicked? And then God says, well, He would use an ungodly nation like Babylon to punish Judah but then Babylon would be punished also. And Habakkuk then came to the understanding. So we see in the mind of an individual who was wrestling with something. All right, we come to Zephaniah. His name means the Lord is my secret. The Lord is my secret. Zephaniah is the writer. You get in and look at it. His great-great-grandfather is King Hezekiah. Key features of the book. The coming day of the Lord. 
That's mentioned seven times in Zephaniah. And that just means destruction is coming. Now, Zephaniah's prophecies may have influenced King Josiah to start the revival and reformation that he instituted when he was king. Haggai means feast, solemnity, or solemnity means serious. The writer again is Haggai. The key feature of this book, Thus saith the Lord, or something similar to that, is mentioned 26 times. That just means his message was from God. Also, the little phrase, consider your ways, is mentioned four times. Which means that self-examination is required. Self-examination. Haggai, he was considered with a spiritual indifference in Judah. Whenever Haggai was written, Israel had come back from Babylonian captivity. They had started building the temple, rebuilding it, but they stopped. 14 years earlier than when Haggai was written. And he is encouraging them to get busy and renew their efforts in building that temple. Zechariah means the Lord remembers. The Lord remembers. The writer is Zechariah and he's contemporary with Haggai. They were both there encouraging the people to rebuild the temple. Now the key features of this book is the longest of the minor prophets. You know what the difference between the minor prophets and the major prophets are? The length of the book. The length of the book. Not one more important than another, but the length of the book. There are more prophecies about Christ in the book of Zechariah than any other prophet except for Isaiah. Zechariah pleads again with the people to return to God. He was commissioned along with Haggai to exhort the people to rebuild the temple. He used a lot of symbols and figures in his book, and that makes his writing a little harder to understand. But they are also contemporary with Ezra and Nehemiah. And Ezra 5.1 says, Then the prophets, Haggai the prophet, and Zechariah the son of Iddo, prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them. So he was... They were both trying to get them to get back into the proper worship of God. And then Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, my, or his name means my messenger or my angel. And of course, the word angel means messenger. The writer is Malachi. And he is contemporary with Ezra and Nehemiah and Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, who was a ruler at that time. The key features of that book Whenever you look at it, it's actually an argument taking place. There's a charge by God. This is what you're doing. The excuses of the people. And then God refutes their answer. I'm going to show you Malachi 3, eight in a minute to show you the, the course or the pattern that it takes place. Now, the coming of John the baptizer is also mentioned in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Malachi 3.8 Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? And he says, in tithes and offerings. And we see several arguments along that way in the book of Malachi. In Malachi 3.1, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Of course, the messenger that would come would be John the baptizer. So he's prophesied here. Malachi, he rebuked Israel for becoming indifferent to the commands of God. They were dishonoring and disrespecting God because they were sacrificing imperfect animals to Him. And the priest had corrupted the worship. The people had intermarried with the heathen nations that God had commanded them not to do. And Malachi is trying to tell them to come back. And then that's where the Old Testament ends. That's the last book that was written. But then we come to the New Testament. Now, I'm not stopping yet. I've still got another whole page to go through. See, I'm trying to wake you up there. We're going to go through it as far as time will allow us. A brief summary of the books of the New Testament. You know, a little chart right there. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The life of Christ from His birth to His ascension. The book of Acts. 
Many of the New Testament books were written during the time period of the book of Acts. James was written at that time. Ten of Paul's letters were written during that time. The New Testament from the end of Acts to the writing of the Revelation. There are three of Paul's letters, three or four of John's letters, four other general letters. These give you the time periods when they were written. And of course, Revelation being the book of prophecy there in the New Testament. So let's begin here. Matthew, his name means gift of Jehovah. Gift of Jehovah. The writer is Matthew. You may realize by reading through there, he is never called the writer of the book. But strong historical tradition from the early 2nd century says he wrote the book. The date of the writing probably between 60 and 70 A.D. Matthew is known by a couple of different in a couple of different ways. This is the man Matthew. He's known as Levi the son of Alphaeus, Mark chapter 2 verse 14. And as he he being Jesus here passed by he saw Levi the son of Alphaeus sitting at the receipt of custom and said unto him follow me and he arose and followed him. In Matthew chapter 9 verse 9 is called Matthew and as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he saith unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. See, in your Bible study adventure, you're going to see different names for different individuals. For the same individual as well. Matthew is not ever mentioned again after Acts chapter 1, verse 13. That verse says, And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room and abode or where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zelotes and Judas the brother of James. That's the last time Matthew is mentioned. The key features of the book of Matthew. Matthew was written to a Jewish audience to prove that Jesus was the Messiah who was promised in the Old Testament prophecies. There are some 53 quotations 76 allusions from 25 of the Old Testament books that are given in Matthew. And it is the only book here, the Gospel, excuse me, to mention the church by name. You know, in other places it may be called Kingdom or something like that. This is the only one that mentions the church by name. Matthew 16, 18. Jesus said, I say unto thee also, or also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In Matthew 18, 17, And if he neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen and a publican. Again, Matthew paints a portrait of Jesus as king. The royal lineage of Christ is shown in the genealogy. His birth is despised by an earthly king, Herod the Great. Wise men offer royal gifts to him. His coming kingdom over which he would reign is announced. His message has a kingly authority. His miracles show his kingly credentials. He is hailed as the son of David. David, of course, being one of the great kings that they looked up to. His crown of thorns, more beautiful than any crown of gold or jewels that this earth has ever seen. The inscription above His cross was, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Matthew 27, 37. And set up over His head this accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. That book was written to convince the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. When we come to Mark, His name means hammer. Found that interesting. Hammer. The writer is Mark. Again, Mark is never mentioned in the book as being the writer, but strong early historical tradition says that Mark, also called John Mark, wrote the book probably somewhere between fifty, uh, late 50s, early 60s A.D. Mark was the son of Mary of Jerusalem. Acts chapter 12, verse 12. And when he had considered the thing, he came into this, he hears Peter. He came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. That just means that Mary was Bartholomew's sister. You know how we know that? Because Mark was the nephew of Barnabas. Colossians chapter 4, verse 10. 
Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom ye receive commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. And of course, Mark being the one that went back from Paul and Barnabas on the missionary journey. Key features of the book of Mark. Mark was written to a Roman audience. It is fast-paced. It is full of excitement. Mark uses ten Latin words and explains Jewish customs that the Gentiles wouldn't understand. The Greek word straightway, which means immediately, is found 42 times. Straightway is a word of movement and action. You know, the Romans were, were, action, they were action-oriented, and that's why it was written that way. Mark stresses actually more of what Jesus did than what He said. Mark shows Jesus to be the Son of God and also a busy servant of God. What Jesus did proved who He was. Mark shows the power of Jesus both over the visible world and the invisible world. When we look at Mark 12, 1 to 20, uh, 20 excuse me, Mark 1, 23 to 27, says there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit and he cried out, saying, Let us alone, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commandeth even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. So there was his, <clears throat> excuse me, his power over the physical world but also spiritual as well because of that unclean spirit. Same thing is shown in Mark 5, 38-42. He cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and seeth the tumult, he being Jesus, and them that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he said to them, Why make ye this ado? And weep, the damsel's not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. They knew she was dead. But when he had put them out, and he had taken the father, and taketh the father and the mother of the damsel, and them that were with him, and entereth into where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha Kumai, which is being interpreted, Damsel, I say unto thee, Arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was at the age of twelve years. And they were astonished with a great astonishment. You see how fast-paced the book of Mark is written. Also, Mark shows the position of Jesus as being the supreme minister. Mark 10.45 For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give His life a ransom for many. What I want to do is finish the Gospels, and then we'll call an end to the day. How about this morning? Luke. His name means luminous or white. The writer is Luke. Luke is the only Gentile writer of the books of the Bible. The date of his writing was in the early 60's A.D. Luke wrote to an individual named Theophilus. Luke 1, 1 through 1-4. It says, Therefore, as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were witnesses and ministers of the Word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first... Now, how could He do that? Through inspiration. Having perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write them unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. I want to point out one thing to you here in this verse. Remember that little phrase, most excellent Theophilus. Alright, now let's go on. Luke is mentioned only three times by name in the Bible. Colossians 4.14, Luke the beloved physician and Demas greets you. Now we know what Luke's profession was. 2 Timothy 4.11, only Luke is with me. This is whenever Paul was about to be executed in the Roman prison. Take Mark, there's Mark again, and bring him with thee, for he is profitable for me to the ministry. And then, 
Philemon, verse 24. Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, that's Luke, my fellow laborers. Key features of the book. Luke was written with the Gentile mind in consideration. The most, or Luke is the most extensive gospel narrative of the gospels. It fills in the blanks about John the Baptizer's birth. It reveals parables that the others don't. The parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son, or the prodigal son. The good Samaritan parable is shown there. The promise to the penitent thief on the cross is shown only in the Gospel of Luke. And Luke covers the life of Jesus very extensively. He proves to the Gentile world that Jesus is the Son of God. His genealogy covers from Adam to Christ. Matthew's genealogy follows from Abraham to Christ. That also shows the different groups that were being written to. But you go look at the genealogies, you'll see that different names are in different places. Why is that? That's part of your Bible study adventure to discover. Now John, so you're going to have to remember oh excellent Theophilus for two weeks. John means the grace or mercy of the Lord. The writer is John the Apostle. The opinions to the date of the writing of John are anywhere from before the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 to after AD 90. The only John mentioned in the book of John is John the baptizer. John is never mentioned. He calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved or some phrase like that in four verses. John 19, 26, Jesus therefore saw his mother, this is while he's on a cross, and the disciple standing by whom he loved, and saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. In John 20, verse 2, She runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. John 21, 7, Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he girded his fishers coat unto him, for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea. And then John twenty one twenty. Then Jesus or excuse me, then Peter turning about seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? And we know from the other gospels that that was John. Key features of the book of John. John wrote to the world to prove Jesus was the Son of God. We'll look at John 20, 30, and 31 in a minute. John provides us details about the Holy Spirit that we would not know from any other work. That's in chapters 13 through 16. He gives us an extensive look at Jesus' farewell discourse on the night that He was betrayed. We see the resurrection of Lazarus given in minute detail. We find other material in John that is not found in the other accounts of the Gospel. In John 20, 30, and 31, John wrote, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of His disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through His name. So John writes to convince mankind that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. John cites witness after witness to prove the truthfulness of the confession that Thomas made in John 20, 28, which is, Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. See if I can push the right button here today. There we go, to blank it out. Tell you what, brethren, the Bible is a fascinating book because it's written by inspiration. The Bible is where we find what mankind must do in order to have eternal salvation. We've looked at these previous lessons many times. We must hear the Word of God, Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. We must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Jesus said, For if you believe not that I am He, you shall die in your sins. John 8.24 We must repent of those sins. Acts 2.38 Peter said unto them, 
Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We must confess the deity of Christ. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Your confession is made unto salvation. And then be immersed in water for the remission of sins, as we saw a while ago in Acts 2, 38. The Lord will add you to His church, Acts 2, 47. If you are a Christian this morning, we must understand that we have to be, must be, or commanded to be faithful unto death, Revelation 2.10. So this morning, are you faithful to God? If you're not, you need to come back. If you're not a child of God, you can become one this morning as well by obeying what we just mentioned, that the gospel of Jesus Christ commands. If you have any need, we invite you to come now and make your need known as we stand and sing. especially if you're visiting with us. Mind you, we meet this evening at 6 p.m. for worship and 7 p.m. on Wednesday for Bible study. Closing song this morning will be number 46. Sing the first and last verse, and then Caleb Francis will lead us in a closing prayer. Number 46. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus, take this heart of mine. Make it pure and holy thine. Thou hast bled and died for me. I will henceforth live for thee. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we are departing from each other this 
day. Let us take back what Don has given us from your word of God. Let us remember that your son came and bled and died on the cross for our sins. And this prayer in his name, amen.